something akin to a future of storytelling? Is it, is it something that has a past, a future? Are we in a moment where, where something is changing fundamentally? Uh, yeah, I kind of do. Um, I think that <clears throat> uh, pardon me. the world has, a, or the business has evolved to a place where um, you look at the storytelling in feature film, and yes, that is what it is, sort of the uh, mid-level, f- you know, 50 to $100 million feature film, sort of, or uh, I would say 20 to $50 million feature film doesn't exist anymore. And if you're above $100 million, you're one of the tent poles, and if you're below $10 million, you sort of don't exist, and you have to kind of fly under the radar like a film like uh, The Florida Project, which we were talking about a second ago. But the real change, I think, is in television. And if you look at, uh, you know, sort of limited series, say, or long arc serialized drama, and I know this is sort of uh, news that's been on the radar for probably a few years now, um, I would say that that's the biggest change. I mean, it's one thing to shoot like a TV movie, but when you shoot a miniseries or you shoot six episodes of a show and you have a hand in producing it, as w- which is, was my role on Pure, that was a game changer. TW, you, you've also been, been directing in, in traditional TV for a long time. How, how do you feel the storytelling has changed in this moment for TV? I don't think storytelling has really changed since, like, Aristophanes. But the rhythms of what we're doing now are changing. I think there's a greater variety. I think, as Ken's pointing out, you have... Different formats. It used to be just TV movies and ser- and uh, you know episodic, truly episodic television, um, and now you have broader and more broader canvases, more narrow canvases, shorter pastiche things that build to something else. So I think um, formats changing a little bit, but I think that you know the art of storytelling is is timeless. It has a past, it has a present, and it will always have a future because people thrive on it. Peter or or David, um, Ken has said that storytelling has changed. TW has said it hasn't. Do you guys feel differently? I I mean, I like both of those answers. This is kind of a technical answer. And I was going to, like, I was going to, you went back to the Greeks, but I was going to go back to, like, you know, people gathering around around a fire. Cool, cool. Story is story, and it will always be. It will always be. I think the mediums are changing, but I, and, and, and changing, yes, but also just more mediums are kind of, you know, I think they thought movies would destroy the novel, but the novel never went anywhere. Do you know what I mean? I think TV is an experiencing a renaissance, but I think virtual reality, digital, um, I think some of the best storytelling is happening in gaming. You know, I wish I was in game design and this sort of thing. Like, some of those, those stories are epic, you know, and they're really well told. Um, so I think the fundamentals of story, uh, as TW says, are not changing. But, yeah, platforms are adding. More and more platforms. The way I think about stories has changed dramatically over the 30 years I've been doing this. Um, Because of the nature of the medium now, I think we're maybe seeing the slow decline of procedural TV. Mm. Uh, Maybe. Mm. Um, I I, I would say good riddance to it. Um, But that's but a lot of people like it. I used to watch Law and Order. I I love that. My parents love NCIS. It's it's, like crazy. It's it's a great show, and it's the same show every week. So, and that's cool. And I think like like that the challenge is that long arc storytelling is very attractive. You see it, you know, I, I'm just like anybody else, or most people, I, if I see something that's really good, I want to do that. So I'm like, oh, the Florida Project was awesome. I'm going to do something like that. Or, no, I, Tanya, is really good. I'm going to do something like that. So the series that you like tend to be kind of long arc stories, but then when you sit down and tell a story, you have to ask yourself, do you have 10 hours worth of ideas? Is, is there... Something you watched, whether it was a film or, or a TV show or even a YouTube video, that sort of caught your attention and went, whoa, something is really different. I think a lot of people reference House of Cards in the general conversation about this, but was there a moment where you're like, oh, okay, I get it. Audiences, audience expectations are changing. They're watching differently, and people are now starting to do these series differently. The Night Of mm-hmm. and Mindhunter, mm-hmm. which were very director-driven mm-hmm. series. And I think that... Um, because I, I got a bit of a friend of a friend inside track on how Mindhunter, incidentally, it was that Snowbird. It was a guy who was hooked up with David Fincher, and he was talking about how Fincher wanted to change the sort of landscape uh, because the, the conventional wisdom, at least in the United States and now in North America, is that the showrunner is king. Mm-hmm. And so it's all about the written word. I come out of theater, and so a playwright's rules I completely understand. But I've been a director a lot longer in television than I was 
a, a playwright in theater or a director in theater or my failed acting career in theater. And now, you know, I realize just how much more, uh, you know, important sort of an approach that includes some visual stylistic elements. And it's not just all about the style. It's about supporting the emotional underpinnings or, or thematic elements of a story with how you shoot it, how you compose a shot, how many cuts you make in the film. So I look at shows like that as game changers because they appear to me like Steve Zalian's work on the night of was like one of the most, I was gobsmacked by that. So it started out very dark and then went to a very philosophical place. Uh, the night of was definitely one that I was uh, pretty riveted by. I, 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 um, I watch all of these things and I consume them as a, as a, as a consumer, but also with a critical eye as well. But that was one that I thought was kind of flawless. Mm. Uh, TW, uh, any specific project you worked on or watched? I mean, David was talking about the death of the procedural, and I, I you know, remember doing a lot of shows where we would, we would have you know, a mystery of the week or whatever, and then the long arc would be one of the, police, one of the policemen's cats you know, was dying or something. And it would take four episodes to die. And that was, and the actors are just dying for those scenes with the cat, you know, <laughs> where, where something other than asking questions. And that's been a real evolution that I'm sure we all welcome because we don't want to, you know, do, God forbid, a whole series of that or, or even come in and just do one like that. We want to get deeper. We want to tell more of a story. You're saying nobody wants to do that, for sure, shoot procedural stuff, but I've done it literally a hundred times <laughs> and can say it's, it's grueling mm -hmm. to be in a, to work to a format where, um, and you know, it's, it's really good, but there's a really specific set of rules so that are designed to make the show be the same mm -hmm. with the exception of the sad cat part. <laughs> and that's really true. The actors are like, oh my God, this cat thing's fantastic. Because can, I can get through all this exposition. I'm just going gonna, gonna to do all this stuff. I'm going to tell the story. I'm going to be the, the radio. But then that, those, that cat stuff, I'm going to kill it. Well, I guess I would say that, uh, you know, with all due respect to procedural too, I, th I still think there is a life for it out there. If you look at sh shows like uh, The Good Wife, for example, which is a terrific television show, which I don't watch that much of, but it is a show you can dip into and come out of. Mm -hmm. And you'll, you might miss the serialized side of it, but you'll still, you know, if you just want something while you're doing your ironing, but it was which I do too. on my own. What's it that? was there, too. They had that going on, which was great. That was the great thing about that show, I think, is that you could watch it like that, but there was this big, long story about their marriage and all that. I thought it was really cool. Was yeah, and I, yeah. yeah, and I think yeah. broadcast television still has an appetite for that sort of yeah. thing. And you know what? I kind of, I only did like six episodes of it, but I kind of got into how much of a filter you had to squeeze everything through to get, there was something interesting about being so constrained. You had to find a way. And it's like you looked at all the other shows and I said, I want my show, it has to be like that, and I understand that, but I want it to be different. And as a storyteller, that was kind of fun too. I don't ever want to do it again, but at the time, it was <laughs> kind of great, and I learned a lot from it. I get it, but you know, what, it, what happens is, like at a certain point, when do you say... You know, there's going to be, well, we're going to have 15 minutes of this, and then the hero is going to be presented with some kind of fucking obstacle, and then they're going to overcome that, and then there's going to be some kind of redemptive moment, and I cannot watch that one more time. <laughs> yeah. I know, but, and, and I agree with you, actually. Those, 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 that, those, those restraints can be good, but eventually, like you're talking about the night of, I don't want to wreck it for anybody, but that's an insanely good series. Oh my God. And it, un crazy. it unravels so patiently. But it's essentially a police procedural. Procedural in terms of that it's a, it's a crime thing and it's got cops and lawyers and stuff. So um, when I'm talking about procedural, I'm specifically, this is, what's this thing called? Evolving landscapes. So we're talking about <laughs> the, we? evolu right? uh, the evolution of it. I'm talking about, and you know, the, the week-to-week procedural thing. And, but I, I know it's not going away. In fact, NCIS is the biggest show in the world still, probably, right? I feel Mac like everybody's porn. sort of talking to me about NCIS. I, I don't watch it, but, but, but my parents do. I just want to like, make sure everybody knows that. Right? <laughs> <laughs> I'm not a fan. Yeah, sorry. I just keep... You're like my so NCIS So what, what do you hate about NCIS? What's your problem with it? 
it's, it's not that I hate it, but the whole time I'm watching it when I'm at my parents' house, my mom talks about Mark Harmon. She loves Mark Harmon. She'll watch anything that guy's in. So. And you don't. What's wrong? What, what do you have against Mark Harmon? <laughs> Okay, I'm not on this panel. I'm running this panel, so I say we move on. So let's talk mechanics really briefly here. On Pure, specifically, is there anything that you did differently on this series, craft-wise, that you wouldn't have done, say, five years ago? Is, did you think about it any differently? Is, is there anything that you were like, you know what, I'm going to try this? Um, I would say no. I mean, I, everything I did on the show was different. But that was a result of telling a different story that was set in a different world. It's a very uh, unique world, the world of Mennonites and Mennonite drug dealers. And, uh, you know, so it, it had its police procedural elements, but it was really about this uh, uh, single man's uh, calling to become pastor of this town and his falling from grace. So I had to paint a picture of two different worlds. And I tried to stay away from, you know, I didn't want to do it with color, which is what you always do. I wanted to do it a different way. So I think uh, Tom Best and I were successful in uh, painting a pretty unique picture um, and differentiating the sort of Auslander world, as the Mennonites would call us, and the insular world of uh, their faith and their colony and their church. And so I would say, no, my approach wasn't any different. What was different was the story. And so I, and because I had the power, because I also executive produced the show, and I shot all six episodes and pretty much got the cast I wanted, um, you know, at this ridiculously low budget level, I still could do whatever I wanted to a degree, um, mostly because I wasn't near any uh, sort of studio or network head offices in Toronto. We were out in Nova Scotia, so we were kind of left to our own devices. We kind of got to do what we want. You know, Michael Amo wrote all six episodes. He and I worked very closely together on it, and it, it felt like a really kind of, it was an enriching collaboration, and I felt like I was able to stretch in a way I've only been able to do, you know, I can count them on the fingers of one hand in my career. Uh, and that was what was refreshing about it. But in terms of my approach to the story, I think I approach every story the same way, which is, what is the script telling me? Is, is there anything you did on the disappearance that you felt stretched your own craft that sort of matched the moment a bit? Um, you had tough subject matter, and um, is, is there a way that you wanted to go about it that you felt was stretching you a little bit? Yeah, absolutely. I mean, I treated it like a feature, and it's like, and it was, you know, it's a 54-day shoot, you know what I mean? And so that's like longer than any time I've had to shoot a feature in my life. So, and you're exhausted and you have like all your weekends are consumed with preparing the following week and all that kind of thing. So it stretched me like literally physically, but also emotionally and creatively. Um, I had a very distinct vision for it. Um, I worked with one editor. We edited it very much like a movie. Um, we, I wish that I was in Nova Scotia. I was in Montreal, but I was, um, which is a beautiful place to be, but I was closer to HQ. Do you know what I mean? <laughs> and there was a lot of battles also that happened. So there's a lot of politic that play. Good battles. Like I really respected my executives on that show, but um, I didn't get, I didn't win everything. You know, I didn't get everything my way. I got, I would say it's like collaborating with my partners at, uh, at Bell Media. Um, I was like, you know, 85, 90% of that is like what I wanted to do. Um, but it was one of the more fulfilling projects of my career in part because it's like, um, if you like it, you can blame me. If you don't like it, you can blame me. You know what I mean? That's my, that show has a distinct Peter Stebbing stamp on it. And, uh, that's my vision you see up there. And, uh, I'm very proud of it. Um, I guess T.W. and David, um, is either of you wanted to pull out an example from your most recent projects? Is something that you got to do differently? You know, we, we I think we all try and do our best work all the time, and it, it involves um, variation and pacing rather than pace, and 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 you know, a developing of some kind of vision for what you're doing, and then being given the room to express it without, you know, the usual well, what, what, whatever you know, without being crushed by a form or, or a studio or an executive or, or a, a tyranny of, of multiple voices or whatever. And that's what we try to do. I don't think we ever try to do anything differently. We look, at the, we look at the script and the story and we try to tell it. 
you know. Um, but what we're allowed to do and what we get to use in the end, I think, is the difference. And that's why okay. projects like what you guys are talking about are so rewarding. Um, I, I mean, I think that's what, David, that's what I strive to do. Do you feel that way, that you yeah. have a I mean, more room? It's, um, well, it depends. The, the, if, if it's something that you're doing by yourself, you get that room. If it's everybody here has done hired gun work. So last year I was in Ireland shooting Vikings and, and uh, a couple of times. Ken can attest to this. You, tons of freedom. Like they, uh, the one man writes all the episodes yeah. and sometimes he writes, I just kind of want to feel this and you just go and do it. And That's you've cool. got means and money. Then I came back, I did a couple of episodes of Mary Kills People. Similar kind of thing. I know Taz was, and then I did uh, some Taken for NBC, yeah. which is like working in a straitjacket. <laughs> There's no and, which is fine, but that's the gig. The yeah. showrunner tells you how it is, and you go do it. Uh, that's it. Um, Ken, I understand actually from uh, uh, Rebecca, her, that um, you actually enjoy mentorship as, as an aspect of your career quite a bit. Uh, what role can the director play in widening opportunities for people that might not have the opportunities that all of you guys had? Well, mentorship is a great way to do it. But how do you, how do you execute that? How, how can you influence that? Uh, by offering myself to, I, I did a few years ago. I did this thing called the City Life Project, mm -hmm. which was uh, I was invited uh, to be a mentor to a young filmmaker maker named uh, Alicia Bunyan Sampson. Really, really amazing young filmmaker, uh, Guyanese roots, um, you know. And she's trying to make a go of things. And my mentorship, uh, you know, with her, on, I, I'll tell you. Uh, going through that project and watching her make that very personal short film, I think I learned more from her than she did from me. That's the first thing I want to say. And the second thing is I have kept in touch with her over the, I guess, four years since that happened. And, you know, I've done, I've kind of promoted her wherever I can. So that's one way of doing it. Another way of doing it was, like, uh, I don't want to go, I keep going back to Pure, but Pure was an interesting example because we're dealing with a world that's essentially white. Mm -hmm. It's Mennonites. But... We were very, uh, you know, I think we did pretty well. I mean, uh, other people would have to, I guess, be the final arbiters of that, about having a cast that was quite diverse. Mm -hmm. um, you know, outside of the Mennonite world, it was like we had a cop whose son was a person of color. Uh, the main, I mean, in the police station and in the outside world, we tried to be a whole lot more representative of what it would be in southern Ontario, tried to stick with that. And, and I think we did pretty good. Um, and that was, that was a conscious effort on our part to sort of, I mean, we weren't trying to m misrepresent the story and do diversity for diversity's sake, but I think if you look at a lot of television now, and I think pe people are finally waking up to it, it's ridiculous uh, that there's not diversity in it. And, and it sort of makes sense when you look at a show that looks a little bit more like the kind of daily life we experience here in Toronto, it's, you know, it sort of speaks to the veracity of the storytelling. So those are a couple of ways of doing it. There are a million more, and I'd be glad to learn them. Peter, when you're working on a series, do you feel that you have power or influence to perhaps bring somebody on set to learn directly in a, in a commissioned environment? Um, do you feel that, that the broadcaster would support that? Do you feel that the, the team, the crew, would support that? Do you feel you have that power? Yes, and influence is the word. <clears throat> Um, I, fi I find it's, um, you know, often you'll go to a, a production company that's, and they'll say, someone wants to shadow me, is that okay? Often they'll say yes, sometimes they say no, they've had bad experiences with it. But, um, but uh, certainly I've had a lot of people shadow me. Um, but I feel a bit funny about this whole question. It, it, you know, it's a funny question because it's like I... I it's complicated, and I would, all I would say is, like, I grew up in a, you know, I was raised by my mom, and I had three sisters, and there was never any debate about whether you could or could not do something. You know, that wasn't on the table. Mm -hmm. But my mom used to talk about uh, just widening circles as opposed to, like, ladder climbing and that kind of thing. So you, so what can I do? Like, maybe this is a bit philosophical, but it's just like, like, yeah, just open the circle, widen out. You know, mm -hmm. that's just a kind of philosophical approach. And there are probably a million more practical things that I'm not doing that I could do. But I also, I like to shadow people and I like to support people and I champion people. I, I think there's another aspect to this question. And 
I, I have to be honest, I've become much more aware of it as a viewer since, since Time's Up, since Me Too. Um, I'm gonna totally out myself as the person who watches the worst TV ever, I guess, but my husband was watching Entourage, I don't know why, the other day, and I looked at it and I was like, this would never happen now, this, it feels so outdated, it feels off, it just, and like, I think I would have laughed at it before, but now I didn't even feel like I could laugh at it. Do you feel that you have an influence as a director in your craft to ensure that how the series is shot is somehow inclusive, representative? Do you, do you feel that you have that ability? I can honestly say I've never exploited anyone or anything in the making of a movie. Not in my personal life. I'm hugely <laughs> exploitative of everyone I meet. But, <clears throat> joke. Um, I, that's the fundament of my approach to to the work is uh, everybody's a character, everybody's valid. It, this is the story about everybody. They're all in it. And, ev and every actor and every background performer and every crew member and even every producer is due respect. And, and that's just a, an absolute for me. And, I, and uh, I think that we should be expected to carry that. I, as the director, that's the kind of stuff you're supposed to bring. Mm -hmm. You know, and... I, I pride myself on that and giving a shit about that. And, and um, I always have and I always will. And I, th I don't see how you can tell a story properly without that. But we, we have inherited, um, you know, a language and a grammar and, and, a, you know, and, a, and a book of images about things that tells, that are meant, signifiers that are meant to tell stories in certain ways. Mm -hmm. And you do have to be a little vigilant about not falling prey to those cliches and all that, because mm -hmm. they do reinforce mm -hmm. political things and, you know, socioeconomic um, biases and all that. But it's got to come from the heart. It's got to come from what's real, what's the story here. Mm -hmm. And we, as interpreters, we're not writing that story, but you, do, you know, you are an author in a sense. And, you know, where is the camera when that woman is taking off her clothes? If she mm -hmm. has to take her off her clothes, where's the camera? Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. What do you want to see? Mm -hmm. What do you not want to see? Mm -hmm. What are you saying? Mm -hmm. You know, and you better be thinking about that. That's all I can say. Uh, you guys have mentioned a few times um, having a little more room in some cases to to make decisions to to execute your vision. Um, can you each cite a specific example of of what you think? changed that has put us where we are right now, which is consistently really, really great TV? Well, I'd like I say, I think it's, I think it's that we're all watching better TV. And I think that um, from the, and I think it happens at the executive level, they want better TV. Mm -hmm. And I think we all want to raise our game continually, right? So I think when we see, when we're inspired by Jane Campion or we're inspired by Fincher. I mean, Fincher used to see a movie every three or four years, right? Now you get to see, like, an episode of television that's like, the guy's a master. I mean, he's an incredible filmmaker. So I'm inspired. I'm watching every frame, you know? And not just how the frame moves, but the stories, too. Because ultimately, the, this all comes back to story. Like, if you, you can, you can have all the greatest intentions in the world with camera and what it should be doing, cinematography and all this, but if you're not dialed into the story, it's going to fail. So I think we're just more dialed into stories. So like the bar is higher, essentially? The bar is higher, and we're raising our game. Okay. Thanks, everybody, for coming, and I hope you enjoyed our conversation. Thank you. Thank you.